Good afternoon. I'm uh, Peter Kistler from Melbourne, Australia, and I'm actually here in Sydney at the uh, Asia Pacific Heart Rhythm Society meeting. And uh, it's my great pleasure to have uh, Professor Greg Lip with me from the uh, University of Liverpool. Thanks for joining us, Greg. Thanks, Peter. Um, Greg's a global leader in, in anticoagulation, and I thought I'd take this opportunity to uh, tackle some of the uh, more contentious aspects of anticoagulation. Um, Greg, firstly, there's been some recent changes to the uh, CHADS VAS score. Um, would you mind just um, highlighting those for us and perhaps giving us a little bit of background as to why those changes were made? Yes, um, Peter. The, um, at the recent European Society of Cardiology Congress a few weeks ago, the, in terms of stroke risk stratification, there, there was a change from uh, the CHADS VAS score to a you could say sexless chads vas, which is chads va. So the, the female sex criteria uh, was removed from the stroke risk stratification. And that uh, perhaps is aligned with uh, evidence recently that, um, firstly, stro in terms of um, stroke risk, from 10, 15 years ago, female patients were at higher risk of stroke compared to males. And there was also under anticoagulation of female patients with atrial fibrillation and should strokes occur, female patients with atrial fibrillation had greater severity strokes and more disability. Over the last 10, uh, 15, 20 years, what we've actually started to see is overall ischemic stroke rates are coming down related to atrial fibrillation and that male-female difference is uh, actually becoming smaller such that in 2018, 2020, that, that difference is no longer significant. And furthermore, uh, in terms of the under anticoagulation, now whether you attribute that to greater awareness of the female sex criteria because of Chad's VAS or whatever, greater you know, guideline changes, then that male-female differences has declined to the fact that more recent years is uh, not so uh, prominent anymore. So. Uh, so that's, that's the epidemiology, but then we need to we test it properly to give the evidence. Then uh, if we, and we published this uh, some months back, uh, uh, and comparing, uh, so from 15 years, from f about 10, 15 years ago, uh, when female sex uh, added or increased the risk of stroke compared, uh, in AF compared to males, Chad's VAS outperformed Chad's VA without the female sex uh, criterion. Yep. So 50, 10, 15 years ago, Chad's VAS performed well. It made sense because female patients higher risk. And in more contemporary years, when there was hardly any difference in stroke risk between males and females, there was no significant difference between Chad's VAS and Chad's VAS. And as mentioned, in recent years, again, uh, the anticoagulation rate differential was, uh, was non-significant. And in fact, in some series, actually flipped the other way. Female patients were actually slightly better anticoagulated than males. So that, that's actually a nice um, segue for us to talk about what um, scoring system you think is appropriate then for assessing anticoagulation risk in atrial fibrillation. Well, all clinical risk scores have limitations. And um, they all perform broadly similar to each other, and ultimate, and and of course, the the many of these risk scores are based on risk factors determined at one time point, and an event, i.e., stroke or whatever, determined five years later, ten years later. But what of course happens in the five or ten years is that patients get older, they acquire new comorbidities. And risk is therefore not static, risk is dynamic. And these risk scores are mere simplifications, they are reductionists uh, to try and make it simple and practical. So whether for stroke risk stratification, whether it's CHADS, CHADS VAS, CHAS 65, whatever, uh, they all perform about the same. So ultimately, a AFib is so common, it's managed by primary care physicians, it's managed by non-cardiologists, managed by cardiologists, not super specialist electrophysiologists. <laughs> Ultimately, the message to give out to everybody is the default should be stroke prevention unless they're low risk. And uh, it, we are also seeing some guidelines how uh, patients are categorized into low risk and moderate risk and high risk. We look after patients. Patients don't necessarily fall into three little neat categories. Uh, so I think 
that's the easiest message to get out to our, I mean, with, I do a lot of work with our primary care uh, physicians and, and more recently also in some of the rural uh, villages and uh, for, for a AFIP management. And the simple message, the default stroke prevention, unless they're low risk. It, it's interesting that you, you brought up the apparent declining stroke rates because I think that had a big impact on the outcomes of, of NOAA and Atresia where the, mm. the stroke rates were around about 1% per year. Yeah. Um, I, I think those studies have really left us with a bit of a conundrum about yeah. how do we interpret uh, device detected yes. atrial fibrillation. Are you able to give us some guidance about duration of AF and CHAS yeah. VAS score? And okay, so um, I'll, I'll start off by discussing the first bit, so you, in terms of how stroke risk, seem to, stroke risk seem to be declining. And you could say perhaps it's a, a, a bit of a change from say a decade ago where um, there was the perception with atrial fibrillation managed, put them in anticoagulants, that's it. <laughs> Nowadays, uh, we recognize that we have to manage more than atrial fibrillation and so-called holistic or integrated care management of atrial fibrillation. And that's reflected in contemporary guidelines now. Now, the European uh, guidelines from 2020, then the Asia-Pacific Heart Rhythm Society guidelines, uh, they uh, recommended the ABC, atrial fibrillation better care pathway. Uh, what is that? That's not a very special score. Or the A is avoiding a stroke with anticoagulation. The default is anticoagulation unless they're low risk. The B is better symptom management rate or rhythm control. And the C is the comorbidities and cardiovascular risk factors and lifestyle factors and the psychological factors, A, B and C. And then, in fact, patient comes to my clinic, very often asymptomatic, newly diagnosed, slightly scared. I can then talk to her, you know, don't worry about it. Uh, you know, well, management plan A, B and C. Um, so, and that's been tested in randomized trials. That's the MARFA trial, uh, which, which used an M Health solution to deliver it. There's also at the ESC the hotline uh, a hotline trial presentation called Miracle AF, and that was done in uh, where the ABC pathway was delivered by village doctors face to face uh, and telehealth. Um, now, in the US guidelines, the ABC pathway, same components, but uh, basically uh, promoted as SOS. So if you've got a patient there, don't worry, don't worry ma'am, your atrial fibrillation management is an SOS. <laughs> uh, and the most recent ESC guidelines did some scrabble and changed it all around again and called it care. So, you know, yeah. tell the patient, we handle you with care. <laughs> uh, so all that has contributed to stroke risk reduction. We're now asking then to seeing in contemporary trials why the stroke risk is obviously um, seems to be much lower than what was recognized before. It's reflecting this holistic or integrated care. So atrial high rate episodes or um, in NOAA or in the case of artesia, uh, subclinical AF included as well. Um, I think it's an issue of um, in these patients that you have to balance in uh, the, not only the comorbidities but also the burden of arrhythmia. Yeah. And in the Artesia trial, particularly when there was the sub analysis comparing by Chadsvas risk strata. So patients with a Chadsvas of four or really four and above, uh, the benefit of ischemic stroke reduction uh, outweighed the small risk in major bleed. And in fact, uh, we also subsequently published an analysis, uh, time to benefit versus time to, uh, and comparison time to harm. And especially if you've got elderly patients, you may well have the, uh, that early risk of bleed, but in the longer term, definitely this uh, benefit of reduction in ischemic stroke. Uh, so that's a bit of individual individualization therapy, there's a stroke risk, burden of atrial fibrillation or SCAF or atrial high rate episodes, that's extremely heterogeneous and we have to take that into account. Yeah. No, I, I think we're commonly asked for a, for a number um, and, and as you've, you've beautifully described, it's, it's an overly simplistic uh, way to uh, interpret stroke risk. I've got two quick ones as we come to a close. You're looking after a patient who'd been on a DOAC with normal renal function. Mm -hmm. They have an intracranial hemorrhage, mm -hmm. whether it be a traumatic or yeah. spontaneous. 
Um, how do you feel about re-challenging that yeah. patient with a, with a DOAC? Okay, so that's a really interesting group of patients because uh, in terms of patients who've had a prior intracranial hemorrhage, those patients are actually not included in the prospective randomized trials, the large phase three trials. Now, uh, you have to look to get some insights from the ep epidemiological perspective. Well, for, uh, the first one maybe just to mention is the patients who had an intracranial bleed related to trauma, um, they are high risk, well, those patients, they behave like if they haven't had an intracranial bleed, so to speak, and in terms of ultimately when things are corrected and uh, in consultation with the neurosurgeons, anticoagulation can be restarted at a time point uh, and uh, that's not it's not a one-size-fits-all in this situation spontaneous intracranial bleed that's a bit more problematic because again it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, this requires uh, what in the UK we use this uh, multidisciplinary team um, um, or MDTs and uh, I'm I uh, join in with our stroke units on the very stroke cardiology MDTs. It brings into consideration uh, what's what you see on neuroimaging, uh, the um, obviously the functional recovery. The but one but a few things worth mentioning. Patients with spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage, they are high risk of subsequent ischemic stroke. They're high risk of mortality. And uh, they certainly have a tendency to have an increased risk of re-bleeding. Um, that risk is lower on a DOA compared to warfarin. No surprise, that's uh, aligned with the trials. Um, and if there are certain neuroimaging features, microbleeds, if uh, also deep cortical versus lobar, uh, I mean, these are sort of things that, uh, again, ultimately uh, you need this MDT type discussion. So it's not solely for the cardiologist, not solely for the uh, in bring, in bringing the GP, the family, the neuro, neurosurgery, the, uh, the stroke physicians. That's it. That's excellent advice. My my last one is um, is um, this concept of using wearable devices or AF alerts on wearable devices in mm. patients that perhaps are less inclined <coughs> to take regular anticoagulation. Do you have a, a, a feeling about that? Um, yes, uh, and, and of course this is uh, uh, an ongoing clinical trial in the US, which uh, I think is uh, going to be really interesting what that shows. And uh, I suppose you could, it, it's really perhaps more relevant when you're getting to the patients towards the, you could say, the, the grey zone yes. between yes. Uh, whether or not to anticoagulate. And if they had an episode of AFib, confirm on the uh, wearable, then they take anticoagulation for about four weeks and if there's no other recurrences in that time, s they stop and restart again. Now, that strategy, I think we'll, uh, the, the small pilot proof of concept studies seem to suggest it's possible, uh, but let's see what the big clinical trial tells us. Right. Well, thank you so much for your time this afternoon and making the trip down under. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.